So here we find ourselves yet again at the monument to Taras Shevchenko. And, um, you know, one thing I don't think I've, no I've mentioned previous to this is that the monument itself is located on this thoroughfare in central Lviv called Freedom Prospect. Um, and I'm filming this on May 9th, Victory Day. It is a huge day on the Russian calendar. It is a day that they celebrate on Red Square with a mighty display of their military power. Speeches are made and they mark with celebration uh, the USSR's victory over Nazi Germany. And of course, it's only right that they do so. Here in Ukraine, though, it's a slightly different affair, much more muted. Uh, and that is because, in no small part, that much of the fighting in the Second World War between the USSR and Nazi Germany happened on this territory, not in Russia itself, although there was, of course, fighting there. But the bulk of the blood that was shed in that conflict between Stalin and Hitler happened on this territory and with Ukrainian troops and Ukrainian people, the civilians, bearing the brunt. So today is not a day of celebration here in Ukraine. No, even without the war, today is generally a day of reflection and it's much more somber and solemn. In the run-up to uh, this day, um, I got to sit down, I had the great privilege to sit down and have brunch with one of the world's foremost Ukrainian historians, Professor Yaroslav Hristak, who teaches here in Lviv at the Ukrainian Catholic University. And we discussed the differences between Ukrainians and Russians, not just about how they see May 9th, but about a great many topics and things. We talked about, again, those differences between Russians and Ukrainians, uh, how Ukrainian history informs uh, who they are and their sense of national identity, and why uh, the history of this nation uh, has led to this current war. Now, we did this brunch and this discussion here at this lovely little coffee house, the Vienna Coffee House, which is also located here on Freedom Prospect. And um, it is a it is a, 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 a place of great pride in Lviv because uh, the claim to fame is that it is built on the location of Europe's one of Europe's very first coffee houses. They say, um, you know, the building is not from that era. Uh, but the location, they say, is where coffee was kind of born and brought into uh, Europe. We talked about all sorts of different things, the professor and I, and I thought it would be of use to you um, to perhaps get a, a better understanding of this country and how it's different than Russia and um, how it found its way to this point in what is living history and um, a moment in time uh, where all of the centuries uh, that led to today, uh, well, why it is and uh, why we find ourselves where we are. So, without any further ado, my brunch with Professor Yaroslav Frischak. Um, so just a quick little note here, preface before the video actually starts itself. Um, I think I was a little over ambitious in trying to do a multi-camera shoot during this brunch and we have some te technical issues and I'm going to try and clean it up. But I still think it's worth posting because the conversation was fascinating and I, I would hate to have thought I wasted the good professor's time. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to try and clean it up, but I'm still going to put it out there because, you know, um, we talked about a great many things, and I think they're still uh, worth here. 
Um, so, uh, you know, keep in mind, I'm not here with a network anymore. I, I don't want to work within those restraints, especially uh, about a topic that is so near and dear to my heart. And I don't have a full production crew with me for the most part. It is just little old me here in Ukraine trying to do my best and, um, and, and give you some insight into a place that I've been coming to for, as I say, uh, over 21 years. Uh, I take full responsibility. Mea culpa. Mea culpa. Um, but uh, I am still going to post this, and I hope you can look past the technical issues that we had. Uh, and I'll try and clean it up as best I can, but look past those technical issues because um, there is uh, worth to the discussion that we had, and I think there's information that can be uh, gained here if, if uh, you know you look past those those issues uh, and, and listen to the words uh, that were we uh, discussed, uh, and hopefully it'll give you some insight into the history of this country and why it is we find ourselves where we are. So, um, with all that having been said, again, my uh, brunch time discussion with Professor Yaroslav Christak. Professor Christak, very much, very, very nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Professor, I want to thank you for your time today. It's very it's kind pleasure. of you to join us. It's my duty. Um, you know, there's so much we could discuss, um, but I want to show you something first off, and I think this is a good place to start. You know, I had my 52nd birthday here on, on oh, really? Sunday, May 1st really? is my birthday. Congratulations. And so for my birthday, I bought myself a copy of Rippin's 1891 <laughs> response, which to me is the original Ukrainian Uruske Karabli Idina Li. But I, me, I think this is also very important because there was, a, there was democracy in this land before America was even starting to consider democracy. Yeah, you may say so. What is it about the Ukrainians, do you think, that makes them desire self-determination and this idea of democracy? Borderlands, very much the United States, by the way. The spirit of the borderlands, the spirit of adventure, the spirit of freedom. Basically, you uh, let's put this this way: that if you follow the world history, one of the most recurrent topic is violence. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Either you are violated or you wild, so to say. And therefore, people here have a very hard life here, because being on the borderlands, which means you have a too many, have to say, the the competition powers, rivals want to come and to govern this land. More specifically, because the land is very fertile, extremely fertile. And, a, and flat, and, and able flat, to traverse. Yeah, flat, yeah. And I would say the, the biggest catastrophic disaster that ever happened is uh, this land that in the middle of the 13th century, the capital of this land, Kiyu, has been totally destroyed by Mongols. Mm -hmm. You should realize that Kiyu by that time was one of the 10 biggest city in Europe. So what happened when you destroyed political center and there's a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And the politics very much like a nature, they doesn't tolerate vacuums. Every, every rival just moved, moved, moved in, so to say. So either you violate or you became a victim, or you try to flee to some kind of space and create some kind of different rules of the game. And it's basically what the Cossacks about. Mm -hmm. Because they were settled in the most dangerous place. The place on the border between the settled, settled, settled society, agrarian society, and the nomads. Because Kozakas became main symbol of Ukrainian tent. Probably the same way like you have a cowboys in, in American history. You know what is the difference between Ukraine and um, Ukraine American story. America has a wild west, we have a wild east. <laughs> I like that. But both of the culture was the same. This is where the spirit has been born. Mm -hmm. Spirit of independence. Mm -hmm. It's very much related with the violence, like the two sides of the one coin. And then every, every empire has tried to control um, this land and they and whether yeah okay thank you oh, oh stru perfect. apple strudel and this is your special yeah yeah okay. would you try some I, I will I will with pleasure to my mind one of the great tragedies of Ukraine is, is that empires have come through here they've always passed through and it's always been never Ukraine for Ukrainians it's always been Ukraine for the Polish Lithuanians and the Austro-Hungarians and of course the Russians can you talk a little bit about, about 
how how Ukraine is able to, to create a self identity when powers are passing See, through. what is the case? You just started with the Don Cossacks. And basically, uh, Ukraine and Cossack, in a sense, they're similar to, to Russian Cossacks. That, if I may put it so, you could easily write Russian history without Cossacks. Because Russian history is basically the history of the state, mm -hmm. of the Tsar, of the Emperor, of the communists, of the Boyars, all kinds of things. You cannot write Ukrainian history without Cossacks. But really, this is an argument that has been going on for centuries about who gets to decide what it is to be a Slav. And if there is a European powerful country like Ukraine, independent of Moscow, that is able to define what it is to be not only democratic, but a European Slavic identity, it challenges Moscow's ability to be the arbiter of what it is to be Slavic. You're absolutely right. Because basically, the question is, the, the bottom line question is, whether Slavs are Europeans or not. <laughs> so what is Why are they so threatened by because, Ukraine? Because Ukraine proves that you could be Slav and East European. More so, you could be East European, Eastern Slav, and be Western, Westernized. Because basically, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia claim that Ukraine, Bel Ukraine and Belarus are the closest. They're actually the same people. They're not the same because they're going west, so to say. And therefore, it's a, it's a really, Putin is not exaggerating. It's an existential threat from Russia. If Ukraine will be for independent, Russia. for Russia, if they can be independent, successful, and Western, that's the end of Putin regime. Because then the Russians will see a Slavic identity. Exactly. And so this, the, is, so, this is so, fundamental so, so, to so their so own the, sense the, of self-identity. The question comes, if they succeed, why could we? Why could we? This is a very simple question, so to say, because Putin is saying, no, we could, this is not our way because we are not like them. Since we are different, we could behave different. We could lie, we could violate all the kind of things. There's no rule for us. We are more than just a nation of states. So if there's, a, if there's a successful Ukraine that plays by the rules of Europe, then Russia will have to have a discussion with itself about whether or not it can also be part of the neighborhood of nations which would commit itself to being a, a, a player by the rules. So the thing is that if you see the history of Russia, 19th century, 20th century, is all the kind of ongoing discussion, whether you're West or East, where should, where should be like, behave like a normal or should be you know, invent something, something different. So, so is this one of the reasons why maybe Vladimir Putin underestimated Ukraine? Yeah, and he underestimated Ukraine because he, he doesn't understand Ukraine. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. He has no clue about Ukraine, what really the clue is. And I believe he really believes what, he's, what he claims, but and his claim is based on total ignorance, so to say. Because first of all, Ukraine is a very much complex country, and it's a blessing. Because once you have complexity to different regions, you have to strike a, a, cons you have to strike a deal which means a consensus, and the consensus is a bread and wine of democracy, so to say. And this is what we probably somehow implement our culture. And there's also a difference, I think, in Russian as opposed to Ukrainian culture, in that everything in Russia is a zero sum. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Exactly, Whereas exactly. I see in Ukraine, it's a win -win. there yeah, is win -win. a chance for us to come to an agreement. You know, I know what's why, because it's very much historical, because being borderlands, it's a very uh, shaky and dangerous uh, uh, situation because you always kind of the being uh, victim of attack, so to say. So what I'm what I'm, what I'm saying here, because there are many rival com superpowers coming and they fight each other, and who are the main victims? The local populations. So what we've seen in our memories, we are much more deeply ingrained in the memory of the dangers of the calamities of the war. We know what war is, really we know. We know it much better than Russians do. Because the, most of the ninth, First World War, Second World War was fought on this territory, not on Russian territory. And we instinctively we shy away from any kind of violent solution because we remember what it what, what meant to us, so to say. So that's what I'm saying. We could quarrel, but by the final day, we sit by the table and we negotiate, so to say. And this is exactly because we have many different history than Russia. And Putin claims otherwise. There's no difference. We're just the same people. And this here is completely wrong, so to say. And based on our ignorance, his ignorance is our, our big advantage. Because he doesn't really understand what's going on, and he's very bad in strategically. He was a kind of disaster, so to say. And we could just, you know, behave like we are, like we do. Can I talk to you a little bit, please, about the trauma of Ukraine's history and how that addresses Ukrainian identity today? There's been a lot of talk about fascism and in, 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 in Nazism in Ukraine. It's a claim that Moscow has put forward many times. I've been coming to Ukraine to know well enough that this is not a predominant um, attitude, but I would be 
I would not be telling the truth if I didn't say that I see trauma within the Ukrainian culture and people. I always say hurt people hurt people because I've been going to wars for many years and I've seen that people excuse their violent behavior because of the damage that has been done to them. I wonder if you could talk about the trauma of Ukraine and how that affects modern Ukrainian. So what I'm saying here, the trauma is a very much part of the every family story. It's a personal stories. Just to give an idea, according to some kind of very approximate judgments, guesstimates, so to say, uh, uh, since the 1914, the beginning of the First World War, until the end of the Second World War, 1944, 1945, every second male and every fourth female perished of violent death. Every third Ukrainian has perished. And that's a generation ago, or maybe it's two. A, it's a three, 30 years, 30 years, several ways of genocides, which affected each group without an exception. How, how do you think that trauma affects national identity today? Uh, people shy away from the war. And this is kind of rule uh, that quite often defeats means much more for identity than victories. Because the things mean empathy, sympathy. You feel more sympathy with victims. And this is one of the other great differences I find between Ukrainians and Russians, is that Ukrainians are ultimately discussing this and realizing there is trauma, and they are trying to come to terms with it, whereas Russia has never come to terms with the trauma of the Soviet yeah, Union. I would say so, if I may use it kind of the formula. Luckily enough, luckily enough, Ukrainians never had a golden age. They could never claim, let's make Ukraine great again. You see me here. Unlike America, like Trump, unlike Putin, so to like say. Putin. Unlike Putin. Because we know what history is. History for us is a tragedy. He won't try to move to leave history behind us. This is our strategy. We're going to the West, we're going to modernize the country. We don't we are not want to stuck in these territories because being Barlands, yeah, it's a kind of romantic, but it's a tragedy as well. And I think as we wrap this up, one of the things that may come of this war and an independent Ukraine in the first time in its history is that there can be optimism. There can be a look optimism. forward to it, that the golden age which has been denied to Ukraine for so long, this is the first maybe time. now is the exactly, first time. Exactly, exactly what I'm saying. You know what's, what's amazing? If you look on the service which you meant recently during the war, what is a tragedy? It's a huge tragedy. What is always tragedy, but specifically this war, the way the Russians behave here, the, the, they kill the people, they, they destroy all the kind of the cities, communication. But despite of that, you see the great optimism of Ukrainians. It's hard to imagine. 70 plus percent of the people, Ukrainians think that think that uh, uh, things are going in, go in the right direction. You see, at the, a time of war. At the time of a war. Terrible and war. they're optimistic because they see the future. They see the future. Russia has no future. Russia has no good scenario, as to say. They have a choice between bad scenario and the wor even worse scenario. And Ukrainians, they have a scenario because they see a vision. So vision and they have a vision probably for the first time in their history, so to say. You know, to strive. And this, I believe, this provides, explains a lot. How Ukrainians feel the world? Why did they? Why did? Why did they so 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 so, 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 they so confident? So to say, how they fight this this way? Because they believe this fight for the future, not only for the future themselves, for themselves, very important for their kids, for their families. But they think this is history. This is war about not just Ukraine, but a larger space, Eastern Europe, Europe, even the world. Because I believe this is my deep, 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 deep conviction that this war is about the future of the world how the future world will look like, what the shape it will take, so to say. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Professor Yaroslav Kresset, if I'm pronouncing that yep, correctly? Correct, correctly. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Slava Ukraina. Thank you so much. You're Thank very you kind. so much. Thank you.